Welcome back to Timeline Iran. Today, we're joined by Professor Azadeh Kian, an anthropologist and sociologist whose groundbreaking work has shed light on the lives of Iranian women. Professor Kian will guide us through deciphering the complexities of the veil, where we delve beyond the surface to understand the evolving meaning and significance of the veil in Iranian society, exploring its historical, religious, and social dimensions. Professor Kian paints a nuanced portrait of the diverse experiences and aspirations of the Iranian women across generations and social backgrounds. We'll be examining the interplay of gender and modernity, where we explore the challenges and opportunities faced by Iranian women as they navigate the complexities of a modernizing society with deep-rooted traditions. Professor Kian's analysis unveils the rich and complex world of Iranian women. This episode offers an understanding of their experiences, challenges, and aspirations in the ever-evolving context of Iranian society. If you enjoy these discussions, please like and follow the Timeline Iran podcast and let us know what you think. Yes, my name is Azad Ekian. I'm a distinguished professor of sociology and gender studies at the University of Paris, Cité, which is a very huge university in Paris. I did my MA and PhD at UCLA back in the 1980s and early 90s. And then I came back to France and this is where I live and I work. And then uh, from 1994 onwards, I went back to Iran because I had left the country in 1981. And then I went back after my PhD in 1994, and I started doing field work there for 15 years, actually. So I have been involved in, I was actually in charge of a very important quantitative survey throughout Iran. And then also I have done a lot of qualitative work with hundreds of hundreds of women and also men throughout Iran. And I have also worked in Baluchistan province, in northern Iran, Golestan province, in Hormozgan. These are all quite uh, the provinces where ethnic minorities live and they are quite underdeveloped uh, comparing to other parts of Iran and where we did not have enough research on the, the, these people and especially ethnic and Sunni women. And this, this is where I really I got very much interested after having worked for many years on women, both subaltern Persian women, also Azeri women, also intellectual women and political elite. I have also interviewed back in the early 1990s a lot of social activists, those who had journals at the time, such as Zanon or Zan and a lot others, and also a number of women members of the parliament at a time under Rafsanjani government and also under Khatami. So I have been working on youth, on women, and also on religion, religious minorities, ethnic minorities, and also on the state, how does the Islamic state function. But my PhD dissertation was a comparative study between Iran and Egypt from the 19th century up to 1980. So I, 1980, that is when President Sadat in Egypt was assassinated and of course 79, Iranian, the Iranian Revolution. So I have also studied Iran's, let's say, contemporary history because my, what, what I studied at UCLA was political and historical sociology, which is a combination of history, sociology, political science and so on. So I got very much interested also in the contemporary history of Iran. At the time, I did not work on women. I only worked in general on Iran and Egypt, but I came to read a lot of materials and also research and books on women's activities in Iran, especially from the 19th century onward. And I started get, getting very much interested in also the history of women's movement in Iran, Egypt, and later on Turkey, because for the past some years, I have also been doing research in Turkey on women's movement in, in Turkey. And then when I got my PhD, I left UCLA, I came to France and started you know, teaching here and going to Iran for fieldworks. Up to 2009, the Green Movement, and then after the Green Movement, it became very hard for me to go to Iran and to do fieldwork especially. So I started kind of shifting my fieldworks from Iran 
to, as I mentioned, to Turkey, which is also a very interesting neighboring country of Iran. And so I continue writing on Iran, working on Iran, and publishing um, in you know in a couple of months and some months a book which is based on my field works in ethnic. Sunnit areas of Iran, especially Balochistan and Golestan provinces. I'm not asking you this as an Iranian professor, but as an intellectual. Why Iran? What's the I got interested in Iran when I went to Iran, starting doing field work. I was supposed also to go to Egypt. As I had been working on the contemporary history of Egypt, I hadn't done any field work in Egypt because I, at the time of my dissertation, I unfortunately could, uh, could not obtain a visa for Egypt because back then I had an Iranian passport and the Egyptians told me that because there were no diplomatic relations be between Iran and Egypt, I could not obtain a visa to Egypt. Actually, I did not have an Iranian passport, sorry. As I was a political refugee, I had a specific passport. But anyways, because I was Iranian national, I could not go and do field work in Egypt. I had learned Arabic. I forgot everything because you know, I'm talking about like 30 years ago. Unfortunately, I forgot Arabic. And anyways, so after my PhD, I went to Iran and I started doing field work my aim was also to go to Egypt afterwards to continue my comparative work but I got so fascinated by this society ever-changing society all these social changes that had occurred during my absence from Iran because I left Iran in 19 end of 1980 went back there from 1994 onwards. And for this, the, during this past 14 years, everything, a lot of things had changed. And so I really started doing fieldwork, as I mentioned, in a lot of villages, in small towns, big towns, among you know various diverse and various populations. And it was so fascinating and I got so attached to this country and to the diversity of its population and to what was going on that I preferred to remain only in, in Iran, which is a huge country, and it's an ever-ending thing, you know. And honestly, every year or every other year when I would go to Iran, I would realize that things had somehow changed. And I saw a lot of women who, despite all the shortcomings, despite all the regressions in, in the, the laws concerning women and family laws and all that, were really struggling hard to survive and also to educate their children, their families, and to transform the society. And when I saw that energy, that willingness, that decisiveness everywhere, among various groups of women. So I decided to continue my studies on, on Iran. So again, this made me forget some Arabic that I had learned. Of course, a lot of Iranians were not happy with me wanting to compare Iran to an Arab country. <laughs> so I was not encouraged either. Important for the, the world at large. Iran is a very important country, both politically, strategically, and also because Iran is a very rich country, as you know, in terms of petroleum, gas, and all that thing. And also because everybody knows that Iranians are quite cultured people, and they are very well educated, and so on. So this is a very important country in a very important region, that is the Middle East. So whatever you do, on Iran, uh, I'm talking about serious work, of course, is interesting and people get interested in what you're doing. For instance, back in those years, the years 2000, the French government, French research institutes co-funded this very huge quantitative survey that we did in, in Iran because they wanted to really get a good grasp of what's going on in Iran or what was going on back then in Iran, whether Iran was going toward modernity or toward tradition, how would people live and, and feel about things and, and so on. So they also invested in research in, on Iran, which is unfortunately no longer the case because the Iranian government won't let researchers go and do fieldwork in Iran, but it is a very important country and overwhelmingly also has become important also because the Iranian regime 
intervenes in the region, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Syria, in Yemen. And so Iran itself is important for itself, but also important because of the policies of the Islamic regime in the region, because they influence the policies also and politics in Iraq and Syria and Lebanon and elsewhere in the region. Our aim is to understand the present. How effective do you think the study of history is in Iran in predicting the present or the future? I personally do think that history and studying history really is important in letting us historicize and contextualize what is going on in a country. Because although today things are quite different from say 20 years ago or 30 years ago or even 100 years ago, but the memory and historical memory is there. The experiences that people have shared many years ago decades ago are still there and are producing results and so it is very important to study the history of a country in order to better understand the people of that country, to better understand uh, also different stakes. And for instance, let me give you an example. When I was doing my field work in Turkmen Sahra among Turkmen's, they would talk about the war. They would tell me, during the war, I did this and I did that. I got married during the war. And I was, talking, I was thinking that they were talking about Iran-Iraq war. And I said, let me ask you a question. What war are you talking about? They were talking about Turkmen Sahra war. And so this was, it did not last long, but it really marked or has marked their entire identities, history, to the point that, for instance, they would say, I got married two years after the war. My first child was born four years after the war. So history is important and people don't forget because we are all kind of products of our history and we, of course, influence also or do have an impact on our history. And also experiences, as I mentioned, are important. And these experiences, even daily experiences we are having, is very much also linked to who we are. And this who we are is very much also linked to the history of wh where we are coming from, who we are. And these are questions that we keep asking ourselves on a daily basis, I believe, right? Looking at our history is so rich and magnificent. <clears throat> Does that cause history overload for us, whereas we don't look back at the last couple of hundred years and, you know, the, we're constantly looking back, Cyrus the Great, Darius, and, and, you know, there's a big <coughs> void between there and now. And I'm not talking about <coughs> academics and professors like you, but when you talk to laymen, Iranians, uh, they're not aware of the recent history. They pick and choose what points mm. they want to associate with us. But do you think this is a... It's like a double-edged sword. Do you think it's advantageous to us to have a rich, such a rich history, or is it kind of uh, bogging us down with overload? Well, both. Uh, actually, I think that having a very rich history, like uh, the case of Iran is, can be what positive for the people because it gives you a kind of a sense of pride, but at the same time can be also counterproductive as it is nowadays because, because people want to r relate themselves to something that is no longer there, that is uh, Ashemenian period, uh, the, the greatness of Iran, and so on and so forth. So they have become quite nationalistic, sometimes even racist, comparing to, or with regard to the neighbors of Iran, for instance, or with regard to even the more recent history. Of, of Iran. So of course it is important to know who we are and where we are coming from, but at the same time it is very important to realize that we are no longer what we were 3,000 or 2,000 years ago. We might be a product of that history, but that history has changed and we should deal with today's world, the modern world, today's world actually. I think that one criticism I might have is this, is that some people are just focusing on uh, the greatness of Iran before Islam, for instance, and want to identify themselves only to this part of us, our history. Iran is a very great country with a big history, with a long history, I mean, but this history is not just 
pre-Islamic history. It is pre-Islamic history and also Islamic history and in a way also, I should say, Western history. So maybe our identities are quite threefold at least, or we have multiplied identities. And uh, just focusing on one aspect of this identity can be counterproductive. So instead of bringing us close or closer to other people, in this world, it might take us apart and we might define ourselves as people who are very specific and very special and so on and so forth. And this also creates a very huge discrepancy between this very glorious past and today's Iran comparing to, let's say, our Arab, our Arab neighbors who are quite, as countries and as nations, are quite recent but have done important industrial, financial progress comparing to Iran, for instance. And this causes a lot of problems, actually, for Iranians. And it has created both a sense of jealousy with regard to our Arab neighbors and even Turkish neighbors, but at the same time, a sense of probably hatred because they compare themselves with this past that does not exist anymore. I don't know whether I'm you know, clear enough, but my understanding is that we still do not have a very well studied, critical view of our history. Our history is either taken as completely positive and 100% glorious, or the contemporary one as negative. But it, our history is a combination of all that. And we should have a critical view of this past history and that the current one in order to be able to find our position, right position in the world. Part of what I'm seeing, at least in the 20th century, is uh, Reza Khan, he wanted to wipe away all remnants of the Qajars, even you know, during the Mossad, that period was a little different, mm -hmm. but then the Shah tried to even wipe somewhat his father's memory and kind of separate himself from him. And then the Islamic <coughs> Republic came and you know, they tried to kind of erase everything. This, this jo disjointed uh, uh, storyline that we have. Uh, talk about what effect this had, it has, has had on us today in understanding the last century. Well, I mean, the, the question you're asking actually is a very complex one. I don't know how to deal with it because when Reza Shah came to power, for instance, it was, of course, to destroy the Qajar dynasty. And to build either a republic or finally he ended up creating the Pahlavi monarchy. Now, he was, of course, an authoritarian ruler, but also a modernizer. His policies also looked at Iran's past, glorious past. If you look at the architecture under Reza Shah, for instance, all these also uh, Farhangistan, all these, you know, the, uh, how language should be also purified from the Arab influence. On the other hand, he was a modern person, wanted to be a modern person, so he also looked at the Western civilization and wanted to Europeanize Iranians in a way like Mustafa Kemal Atatürk in Turkey at the same time. And these two kind of were look at each other and their, how they applied their policies. What I want to say is that when I look at Reza Shah's period, he has modernized Iran, industrialized Iran, created the national army. He kind of came up with what the constitutional revolution and the even constitutional parliament had promulgated but could not realize. He did, for instance, national army, national bank. What something very important he did, I believe, is fund schools for girls. There were only a few girl, school girls, uh, so, uh, f uh, school for girls for he came to power and so on. But they then again, he was an authoritarian ruler, no democracy. He jailed his opponents, even Dr. Mossadegh. He killed and executed several of his opponents in prison. So our modernization in Iran, Reza Shah, the modern nation state started with Reza Shah right from the beginning. The nation state in Iran was based on a nationalistic ideology and also on a non-democratic modernization policies. So Iranians were not exposed 
to modernity really if I mean to political modernity I believe then it created a lot of dissatisfaction and and so on when it came to women also he I believe imposed violence against religious women by outlawing the veil in 1936 and forcing them to put on European dress and, and so on. This is also a part of Europeanization policies, but his policies also were very beneficial to some women from middle and upper class backgrounds, urban women who really benefited from education, from Tehran University and so on and so forth. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is that every ruler has policies that can be beneficial to some and to the detriment of others. And so when you look at their policies and the, the consequences of those policies, we can't just be black or white. You have to see also what, are, what were the implications of these policies. So you have to look at what were the implications of these policies and, for instance, whether they were emancipatory, or regulatory or both. And I think that when it comes to Reza Shah, his policies on women were both regulatory and emancipatory or had both of these consequences. Uh, when you want to look again at who benefited from a policy and who didn't, one way of looking at it is to look at the majority of the population and the minority. The majority of the population in those years under Reza Shah's rule lived in rural areas and they were totally left excluded from these modernization policies I'm talking about. Modernization policies under Reza Shah and even his son, Mohammad Reza Shah, really concentrated on urban areas, which at the time under Reza Shah, only you see 20 to 25 percent of the Iranian population lived in urban areas. And so from amongst this population, not all of them were modern. A lot of them were religious and traditional and were against Reza Shah's modernization policies or his policies on women, for instance, compulsory unveiling of women, for instance, or to a certain extent secularization policies uh, and so on. But a minority benefited, of course, from these policies. Look at, for instance, women who had access to Tehran University or those who could come and do their studies in Europe, for instance, back then under Reza Shah and also later on under the Shah, such as Sadiq Dolat Abadi, who was one of Iranian feminists back in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, and who also came to France to continue her studies here back in those years, 1920s, for instance. Somebody like Shamsul Muluk Mosahab, who did her studies also in Iran and so on and so forth. So we started having a minority of elite women, educated elite women, in Iran who did some positive things later on for women. The, one of the byproducts of Reza Shah's modernization was probably that these women could eventually work toward better conditions for urban middle class women, but not the majority of the Iranian women who again were lived in were either tribal or ruler and left outside of these modernization policies going on. Religious women were excluded from these policies. They would not get out of the house, for instance. They would refuse because they had to get out of the house unveiled if they wanted to go to public space and they just couldn't do that uh, due to their traditional religious beliefs. So again, some benefited from it and some did not, but their daughters did benefit. This is one of the reasons I think that I believe that when you look at the implications of policies, we should give decades for these implications to show their real impact to us. Some mothers in urban areas might have suffered from Reza Shah's policies, but eventually some daughters some of their daughters might have benefited from them. And for this very reason, it is very important to do, really to get into the people, to talk with them as much as we can, or to get closer to their beliefs, get closer to what they feel and they felt and how they dealt with all these things going on in their countries to have a better understanding of the implications of these policies. The most important to me problem I have with Reza Shah was his dictatorship.
of course. And the fact that modernization of Iran and the creation of modern nation state in Iran was equated with authoritarianism. And this was quite detrimental to a democratic Iran even after Reza Shah left the country. Nation state and modernization that is meaningful within a nation state we're talking about nation state is very much relevant to ideology under Reza Shah the Iranian nation was defined as a Persian nation right and the Persian language as you know became compulsory in education in schools in administration and so on and minorities that is ethnic minorities who did not speak Persian had were were forced to learn Persian at school and this basically led to the domination of Persians over other components of the Iranian nation state. Under the Shah, we had more or less the same thing. And then what happened was that under the Islamic regime, right from the 1979, Shiism became the ideology of the state. And the constitution of the Islamic regime and the way the Iranian nation is defined by the regime is a Shiite nation actually. So those who are Sunnis, and by the way, are also, most many of them are also, belong also to ethnic minorities, such as Kurds, such as Baluchis and or Turkmens, are excluded from actually the nation state. They don't benefit from state, a modern state. So this modernization has many problems. One is because the, the way you define modernization as an ideology of progress. But then how do you apply your modernization policies? Where do you apply your modernization policies? To who do you address? Who are the targets of your policies, for instance? And so these modernization policies always, again, target either Persian ones or today broader Shiites one to the detriment of other components of Iran. This is one thing. Another problem with modernization thinking, modernization ideology, is that it was believed that when a country is modernized, the importance of religion would, would, would decline. And this is all uh, the philosophers of modernization who actually thought so. And for instance, under the Shah, this was uh, the basic definition that was behind uh, the modernization ideology that when you modernize a country you can expect religion and also religious people to start abandoning religion to the benefit of modern I- modern ideas and this had political impact if you look at how the shah of iran muhammad reza shah contrary to his father dealt with religious people with masks and basically his understanding was that religion would fade away so he was not really afraid of religion and religious ideology that is political islam and he sort of probably let them also be to some uh, to some extent active in uh, in some places, in the mosques and elsewhere. But as we could see, religion did not fade away and it became a political ideology and, you know, started to even rise to to power in, in 1979. Iranian women, as far as I know, have always dealt with politics in some way. But of course, we have only a few information, for instance, on how ordinary women lived and dealt with these issues. I have a very broad definition of politics. It's not just being a part of political institutions, but how do you influence, for instance, transformations in in your country? So if you you got the Safavid period, for instance, as we know, uh, some women in the harem were quite influential and they had a lot of authority and to the point that they were even counselors to the king and so on. Later on, under the Hajars, again, the harem, and this is contrary to what many Westerners think, that the harem, in the harem, the women were lazy and uneducated and uncultured. This is exactly the contrary. If you look at the, how the harem women were literate and they also quite, uh, were quite involved in, in politics, especially in the Safavid area, but also in the Hajar area, of course, and especially the mothers of the Shah and also some of his wives and so on.
When it came to the constitutional revolution, even prior to the constitutional revolution, some Iranian women who were basically daughters or wives of constitutionalists gathered together, as we know, in already 1905, that was one year prior to the revolution. But even prior to the revolution, let me talk about the tobacco movement, because 1891, 1892 was the tobacco movement where the concession for production and sale of tobacco was given by the Shah of the time to General Talbot, a British subject. And this was very much to the detriment of Iranian both cultivators and also entrepreneurs and so on. And there was a boycott of also religious authorities, Shirazi and others, against the tobacco. And in, for instance, Tabriz, as we know, Zainab Pasha and other women took the arms. They were armed and they closed the bazaar of Tabriz down. We are in 19th century and these were also Iranian women. And then the, the movement spread out throughout the country and to the point that women who used to smoke tobacco quit smoking and finally the Shah was forced to change his mind and take the concession back. So this was the first moment where Iranian women were really involved in a national politics. Although they were not talking about women's issues, but they took part in a true national uprising against a British subject and against the Shah's concession to the British subject. And also in 1905, they started airing demands for their, for women's rights. For instance, they, they demanded political rights for women back in 1905-1906. Now, if you look at the Western world at the time, it was one single country that had granted voting rights to women at the time, and the other ones did not have voting rights. For instance, in France, French women obtained their voting rights in 1944. So this, this was, these are very important to me, very important events, and also a lot of discussions going on between different types of women, some who, who were demanding both social rights and also, of course, polit political rights. And it is interesting to note that the issue of veil was also very very much uh, discussed by these women. But that was a bit later on. But in 1906, uh, during the Constitutional Revolution, as we know, again, a lot of Iranians, women in urban areas, did participate in the Constitutional Revolution. Many of them, 40 of them, got killed even. But, and, and this is a moment where Iranian women were completely chador and even rubande. I mean, you couldn't distinguish who was behind this veil. And this also eased their participation in the revolution because you couldn't recognize who was behind the veil. Anyways, th this was a very, very crucial moment me, the, the women's participation in the Constitutional Revolution, and then later on their sitting in the Parliament 1909 to demand voting rights or political rights and so on. But each time they were told that women's involvement in politics is against Islam and we can't grant you voting rights. This was the answer they always were given. And so they started thinking that unless you, do, you change the culture of the society, or at least urban areas, you can't attain rights. And this is where they started to open. First of all, they started to publish women's journals, 1910, 1909, 1910. And it is interesting that the first women's journal in Iran was called Danish, which means savoir, knowledge knowledge. Of course, they debated. They're interesting because these different debates were going on in these newspapers and, and journals. The aim was to discuss women's issues. And of course, the thing was that the target was educated middle class women. If you read the journals, women's journals of the time, they were teaching middle and upper class women how to take care of their children, hygiene, how to be friends of their husbands, how to manage the, the, the household, and how to make modern couples in, in a way. And, and, and so they, they were targeting, of course, this modern upper middle class women, but they were also discussing the issue of veil. And it's interesting because some of them thought that veil was, Islamic veil was the major impediment toward women's access to the public space. And some others thought that 
veil is our tradition and it, it is no impediment and that women should be get educated and uh, it's true education that women could attain a position in, in the society. And this is where they started also creating schools for girls in uh, many parts of Iran, not only in Tehran or Isfahan, but also Rasht and Tabriz and you know, many, many other parts of the, the country. So what I mean was that is that they really did participate in social and political transformations of Iran, but their impact and their role have not been really acknowledged because it was always in history books and also the way the history was taught and, and so on. It said that kings were given rights to women, a bit later on Reza Shah and then Muhammad Reza Shah and so on. And so the participation, important participation, partaking, I should say, of women in national politics and in the social and political transformations and cultural transformations of their society has not been, have not been acknowledged actually until very, very recently. And when you look at today's Iran and what's going on today, uh, of course, everybody is saying, including myself, that this is in, uh, for in an important part a consequence of social media, internet, globalization, and, and so on. It is true. But some of these women, young women, who are in the streets today, for instance, and they're demanding freedom and so on, also have this or students especially, might have, I don't know, but they might have also a knowledge of how their grandmothers or great-grandmothers struggle to gain rights 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, and so on and so forth. And I think that this acknowledgement of women's roles is quite important in making today's Iranian women, encourages them to fight for their rights. Because when they look at Iran's even recent history, when I say recent, I mean from 1905 up to today, or from 19th century, end of 19th century up to today, they can see that women in this country really always struggled to gain their rights. So this is a very good lesson for them. A negative uh, impact of uh, social media might be that we want everything very quickly. We want to you know, attain whatever we want very quickly. And we might lose our historical memory in, in a way. My understanding is that our countries, and our country especially, is capable of being ruled by a woman. It is some men of power who do not want to see women ruling the country. Under the Shah, in addition to those influences of Alam and Zahidi, Adishir Zahidi, the Shah himself was never in favor of uh, women ruling the country or even gender equality. And he, I have, you know, read or listened to many of his interviews. And he even mentioned at one point that women are not equal to men. And even the best cooks in the world are men. So women cannot even be the best cooks in the world. So why do you think they can run a country? Uh, so unfortunately, patriarchal thinking was and still is predominant within the you know, political elite. And let me tell you that I have studied, you know, we had back in our history, and I say our history, not only Iranian history, but Middle Eastern one, a lot of women who were specialists of jurisprudence, specialists of religion and so on, they taught at religious schools. And I'm talking about 10th century, 9th century, 11th century, Middle Ages. Their religious knowledge was being admitted by everyone, but they could never run a religious school. So they did not have, you know, their religious knowledge was acquired by everyone. They had a lot of students, male students, of course, but they were never given the right to run a school, a religious school, because to run a religious school was a political authority, not a religious authority anymore. Power. And so it has been always a question of power. And I do believe that it is uh, because some men do not take women as their equals and 
some and those men are in power Th this is one thing and eventually the fact that they have always used religion to forbid women's access to power and to politics as uh, for instance was the case during the constitutional revolution and women had to wait until 1963 to gain their political rights and basically gain political rights especially right to vote and of course some also were, were elected but this is what I mentioned earlier they wanted women to become modern this this is something Afsane Najmo body said and I liked it a lot they wanted women to be modern but modest okay be modern but never equal to men and this has always been the case even even today to some extent men accept women's presence in the public sphere and also public space of course to certain extent but all they always want to control them because and this has also a lot to do with the education so there is something also wrong in our modern education as well. And this is changing in our country. If you look at the role a lot of women nowadays are playing in the education of their children. I'm not talking about school education, but education, upbringing, actually upbringing. And they really are influencing their children's upbringing and giving them a very different type of education, which we call permissive education. And they respect their uh, children's opinions and without necessarily wanting it, but they are giving them an education and an upbringing which matches with democratic thinking. If you look at the Iranian families nowadays, contrary to when I was, for instance, I lived in Iran when I was uh, a small kid. I'm not saying that my family was this, this way, but in general, basically fathers had a lot of authority within the families and their wives and children were supposed to respect their father's authority. Today, fathers are almost devoid of authority and the authority, major authority belongs to children. And this is what we call child kinship. And mothers are playing a very crucial role in the upbringing of their children. And so they are transmitting a lot of these values of equality and so on, because they had suffered a lot themselves and they don't want their kids to suffer, especially the daughters to suffer. So this is things that I have been seeing throughout my field works in Iran, in both city towns and also villages. And this, I'm sure, will create a very important change in the upcoming years or decades. Again, the impact of this might not be just for today, but, but in, the, in the future of Iran. And the fact that today you have a lot of young people in the streets, those who are struggling for freedom, freedom of choice and respect for their opinion, are the ones who are the results or the consequences or outcomes of this education and upbringing within their own families. So this is very important and these are quite modern phenomena going on in our country to the point that today many men, we have asked this question, men do not necessarily or are not necessarily against women's access to power. You know, I'm not talking about the men who are in power, uh, not the Ayatollahs, but ordinary men, for instance, and especially in younger generation. Because we have in Iran, the, for the first time in 2016, the number of highly educated women became more important than the number of highly educated men. So it means that men have started to acknowledge that women are there, that women are you know, educated and highly educated, that women are capable of doing things. And little by little, they will accept that women rule the country. Now, the example of Benazir Bhutto, and we have some examples in Indonesia, these were all either daughters or wives of the men of power. And when those men of power were killed or passed away, these women kind of replaced their fathers or their husbands, not on their own, not as women, but as the daughter of Bhutto. So I do not agree that in Pakistan, Benazir Bhutto became prime minister 
as a woman. She became a prime minister as Mr. Bhutto's daughter, in a way, see, and the same in uh, Indonesia and, and some other countries. But I am pretty sure that in the upcoming years, we can really expect that in Iran, women will gain power as women, not as the daughter or the wife of, of somebody. Because the society has changed, that society is accepting women's authority and capability. I think that what I said about young women today in Iran is also true of young men, for the very reason that when these young women took the streets, started protesting and asking for freedom and, and so on, very quickly they were joined by young men. And it is interesting to note that today the change, social, cultural change, has also expanded to a lot of young men. Not all of them, of course, a lot of them. It all depends on your upbringing, who is educating you, and it all depends on mothers. Again, because mothers are, you know, uh, have the key role in upbringing their, their children today in Iran. And there is a very important difference between what kids are learning at school and what they are learning as values, for instance, at home. They do not match. We, see, we know that there are very important differences between the school ideology and what the families are trying to transmit to their children as values and, and so on. So I do believe that young men are also more inclined to accept women's gaining power comparing to previous generations. And this is one of the paradoxes. And the support for women's gaining power, at least to some extent, is real and it's true. If you look at uh, municipal and local elections in Iran ever since 1999, the number of women candidates was quite low, but they got elected in their villages and in their towns, and to the point that even we had some mayors, women mayors, in some towns, for instance. And this shows that not only women voted for them, but men also voted for them because they felt that they were capable of running their villages and their towns, for instance. And this, even in several villages in Baluchistan, for instance, but also other parts of Iran. Women started gaining power at the local level, first at the local level, and they really work well at the local level. Lo when I say local, it's municipal and, you know, in the villages and towns and so on. And then in 2016, for the first time in Iran, Iran's history, Iran's, you know, recent history, about 18 women were elected to the parliament, Islamic parliament. Uh, these women were from civil society. Most of them were. They were not candidates of different factions, but they were really women who came from civil society. They were all educated women, quite young, younger than previous candidates or previous elected ones, and they were the ones who had been active for women's rights. And for instance, I was really, uh, it is surprising to see that people, for instance, in Esfahan, for instance, voted for a woman in some medium-sized towns that are quite traditional ones, women got elected against their male rivals. These all mean that Iranian men are also accepting the idea of electing women to political positions. Of course, you might tell me that what's the use of being in the parliament or what's the use of being at the head of a town, but these are all important steps that women should take before gaining a real important power. But what I have been seeing is that men are overwhelmingly accepting women's access to power, comparing to, again, really 30 years ago, some, you know, 20 years ago. And of course, the younger the men are, the better they accept women's access to, to power. It is also probably due to their opening to the outside world, 
to globalization as well because they see that I know Mrs. Merkel was up to very recently the prime minister of one of the most important industrialized countries they would see a lot of other women in power and so they would ask themselves these questions how come only Iranian women can cannot get hold of power or be in power positions so these might also have an impact and they had a very important impact along with education when you or at university, for instance, in Iran. There are universities everywhere, as you know. You have women professors. So these women professors, as I have seen in my field works, become role models for their students, in, especially in small towns or in some provinces. And so when you are a student of this professor, then, of course, your understanding of what women can do might change also. These are all social changes going on in our country. And I think, and I would like really to emphasize education and women's access, especially to education. The fact is that, as I mentioned, prior to the revolution, the majority of the population, or Iranian population, that is 53%, lived in rural areas. So they were excluded from all these modernization policies and all these changes that were going on in urban areas. But today in Iran, almost 80% of the total population is urban, and the literacy rate is almost 90% for all the population aged six years and over. So this had a huge impact. Or for instance, we have seen in our national survey, we had 32,000 people in our survey. So this is the most important survey ever undertaken after the revolution, sociological questions. And we had seen a correlation between women's level of education and the number of their children. Have college education, percentage I can tell you I know that it's 90 per, almost 87 percent are literate that for sure percentage should be I don't have it in mind really it's higher than men right it's higher than men it is higher than men what percentage probably 30 percent 24 percent within the current system of Velayat Fari and political Islam in power I do not see any chance for women to attain power, political or otherwise, because political Islam basically considers women as inferior to men and also believes that women should serve men and women are considered basically as mothers and wives, not as social beings and not as being able to rule the country. For this very reason, although there is nothing in the constitution to, of the Islamic regime to forbid women from becoming candidates of, in presidential elections. And as you might know, from 1997 onward, we started having women candidates in each presidential election, but they have constantly been disqualified by the Guardian Council, but we don't know why. They never said because they are women because no such a thing exists in the constitution. But of course, the understanding of these people who rule Iran is that you cannot let women rule the country. So un unless there is a change, a substantial change, and unless Iran gets rid of political Islam, I'm talking about political Islam, not Islam, but political Islam ruling the country, I do not believe that women can gain equal rights with men or an even less power positions, real power positions. And I should say the same thing for men. Do you think that today Iranian men do have power in the country? Of course not. They cannot even have their say on their own wives. What I mean by that is, for instance, I'm thinking about veiling, you know, compulsory veiling. You might be a man who is against compulsory veiling of your daughter or, or your wife or your fiancé, but the Islamic regime wants to be the guarantor of this compulsory veiling. The honor, uh, which has become the honor of the regime and the political ideology of the regime. And Iranian men don't even have their say on this issue of whether they want their daughters or wives to, get, to go out of home unveiled or veiled. So the regime is everywhere and they are controlling every aspect of life. This is a totalitarian, this has become a really totalitarian regime. And for this very reason, I do not expect women to gain authority or 
men, ordinary men, to gain power under these circumstances. So, nonetheless, what I do see is this important discrepancy between the reality of this modern society with modern demands and ideas and this regime ruling Iran that is a very backward type of regime. I call it obscurantist type of regime. Well, it's very hard to say where the movement will be getting in, in the upcoming years. But what I know for sure is, again, th that the reality of this society is not compatible with the regime. So either the society has to change and go back to 10 you know decades ago that's not happening that's not happening or the regime should change now the regime could have changed from within with more progressive people in charge who would accept the changes that had occurred within the society and they could have responded favorably to the demands of this society. What we have is uh, quite the contrary. It's an ultra conservative type of power and with a leader at its top who wants to have total power. And so there is this fight and struggles going on and will be going on in the upcoming months. I don't know, maybe years, but what I, I know for sure, and I have been writing about this. I have been seeing these things for many, many years now. Really, I was waiting for uh, the, the society to kind of explode against or against the, the, the political elite and the regime and this political Islam, because you can't have, on the one hand, people who refuse to be controlled or to submit themselves to a, an illegitimate power and on the other hand also political power and uh, religious power that is trying to impose its control on society my understanding is that the iranian society will win i ha i have no doubt about that the only problem is that they are killing our youth this is a problem they are killing our children this is a problem and whether this change that the society, Iranian society is wanting can be attained with less injury, less repression, less killings and so on. That, unfortunately, I don't know. What I can see is that for the moment, they, the only way they think they can stay in power is to repress harshly, to kill, to execute and so on and so forth. But again, regimes change, regimes, you know, come and go. We were just talking about the Shah's regime, Prior to that was Reza Shah, prior to that was the Qajar dynasty, prior to that was other dynasties. People remain. And I think that the last word would be the society that will win this fight. But here you were telling me what else can Iranian women do? For and society. For society, Iranians it is true. But then in the international community can do a lot and they are not doing much. And I'm really fed up with that. You hear, you, you do hear in Europe probably more than in the States, but you just hear it. You just hear it, we talk about it, attract attentions to it. But then uh, how about your real politics or policies against these, this regime and against these people who are really conducting these repress, repressive policies against the population? Not much. You know, only they have in France, they have put like 40 people in, in a list of target sanctions. 40. Thousands of them. Why 40? My understanding is that the eventual pressures that Europe is exerting on the Iranian regime is due to not oil, but basically Ukraine. Iranian implication and Iranian support for Russians in their war against Ukraine. And ever since they started giving a lot of drones to Russia, uh, drones that were used against Ukrainians and so on, Europeans started actually to see things, to say things, to, to realize that it is becoming really dangerous because Ukraine is basically in Europe, this is a war in Europe, and the Iranian regime is conducting uh, indirectly its war against 
Europe and this is where things got serious and they started basically supporting at least verbally I should say the Iranian revolution and probably nowadays they are not thinking of the uh, Barjom, the JCPOA. I think that JCPOA for the moment cannot be dealt with and for the moment it's in an honest standpoint. Although Americans want to come up with a solution, but Europeans are not in favor of, of it. But basically, this is one thing. The second thing is Americans are leaving the Middle East region and if Europe, in a way, is not replacing Americans, they think that Iran would be left as the uh, major power of the, of the region. And that's why President Macron started organizing Iraq conference, Baghdad conference. Conf number two was recently in Jordan, where the French president was trying to bring countries in the region against the Iranian interference in their affairs. Not the Iranian regime necessarily, but Iranian intervention in Iraq, in, in Lebanon, and also in, in Yemen, for, for instance. So these, what I want to say is that the uh, struggles of Iranian men and women in Iran to gain their freedom is very much intertwined with uh, geopolitics, actually. And they cannot just win all alone. Do you think that the Iranian people won the Iranian revolution of 1979 alone? Of course not. Decisions had already been made that the Shah was dying, he had a cancer, that at the time the major concern of the Europeans and the Americans was that Iran should remain in the Western camp. There was this threats from Soviet Russia and so on and so forth. So this is why they chose Khomeini as a religious leader to bring Iranians together to kind of prevent Iran from eventually becoming a part of what the Shah of Iran would call Iranistan, to join the Soviet camp. So because, again, Iran is a very important country strategically and, and so on and so forth. And today, one, main, one reason why all of a sudden everybody is, has become pro-Iranian women wherever I go. Everybody is asking me about Iranian women's struggles and so on. Everybody has become feminist even, is also very much intertwined with the problems with Iranian engagement with Russia and also the interference in other countries' affairs in the, in the region. And, and so on. So can Iranians liberate themselves, emancipate themselves, or implement important radical changes in their countries without international support or international pressure, at least, on the regime? First of all, I do make a distinction between Babism or Babi movement and Baha'ism because Babi movement to me, although I'm not a historian, but Babi movement to me is a reformist movement, a very progressive movement, and Horatul Ain is a very good example of this reformist and progressive a woman who unveiled herself and would talk publicly for, for men and in the 19th century, this was a very courageous thing to do. Of course, there were a lot of other men who uh, supported at the time this reformist movement. So that, that was Bobby movement. It was not religious as far as I know, but then uh, Baha'u'llah turned out to be a religious person. And although he and his teachings are kind of more uh, tolerant with regard to women, but I do not think that basically gender equality is a motto of Baha'ism. And uh, basically what I can see is that what is taught to women is to obey men. I mean, I do not see the same thing as in Bobby movement. Maybe I'm wrong. Again, I'm not a historian, but have not encountered equal teachings or equal opportunities and so on with the Baha'i, because Baha'ism, because it is a religion. And to me, religion led by men cannot be or is not necessarily gender equal. Now, of course, Muslims in general, Shiites, because they are majority in Iran in particular, are very frightened from the Baha'is. First of all, because as you know, Baha'ism is forbidden as a religion in Iran, and you don't even have the right to say you're a Baha'i. And although if you look at religious minorities in Iran, we have Jews and Christians and Zoroastrians, we know their number, 
because you can, as religions that are officially recognized by Islam, they have their cult and they have their yeah, religious practices and so on, and, and they can say, I am Christian or Jews or, or Zoroastrian, but Baha'is don't have the right to say it. Or they, if they say it, they you know, can be imprisoned. So we have no census data, we have no data on how many Baha'is live in Iran. But my guess is several thousands, several hundred thousands, sorry. Anyways, but, and, and this is where I want to talk about political religion and why is that political Islam is to the detriment of not only women, Muslim women, but also, of course, religious minorities. Because Baha'is, as a religious minority, don't even have the right to exist in this country. Because in Iran, religion is in power, and of course, Islam does not tolerate Baha'is. So they, they don't have the right to education, they don't have the right to live. I, for instance, I had Baha'i friends who were medical doctors, and when they learned that they were medical doctors, they forbade them from working in the hospital, and they had their private cabinet, private, uh, yes. and they, they, you know, they lost the practice and they lost everything. And of course, they don't have the right to education and, and, and so on. So this is the Islamic regime, but even prior to the revolution and uh, to the uh, political Islam, I do remember that many ordinary people had a lot of problems with Baha'is, just because Islam do not does not tolerate any religion after Islam. So this might be also related to that. Only non-religious ones or eventually, I should say, secular people for whom being a part of Iran and Iranianness is more important than religion and what, to what religion do you belong, that Baha'ism might not be important. But to the other ones, especially if you are religious, it might pose some problems. Nonetheless, and this is what I want to now very briefly talk about, because what's going on in Iran today to me is not just the issue of I want to wear or want, do not want to wear veil. I think that 120 years after the Constitutional Revolution, for the first time, we have a movement all over Iran that is redefining what Iranian nation is and what Iranian nation state should be. That is to say that despite religions, ethnicities and genders, Iranians are defining themselves as part of or belonging to this location where we call Iran with its history or problems, issues, social movements, revolutions, and so on. So this is crucial. And within what's going on, being a Baha'i or a Shiite or a Sunni is no longer important for those people who are in the movement. What is important is the, their belonging to or their Iranianness. In, in a way. And it is amazing to me that Molavi Abdul Hamid, the Sunni religious authority in Iran, said the other day that Baha'is should uh, have citizenship rights, equal citizenship rights with Muslims because they are Iranians, although they are Baha'is. And this is a Sunni authority uh, that's saying it. So th he is defining everything with regard to Iranianness and not your belonging to a religion. And this is a crucial step forward for a secular Iran. And of course, women are playing, a, have played and are playing a very important role in this undertaking as well. Well, the Green Movement of 2009 was a movement from within the Islamic regime and the major demand, as far as I understand, wrote a book on it, was not to, against the Islamic regime or was, was not to topple the Islamic regime. It was to try to democratize the regime from within. Democratize its institutions, respect for the vote of the population, and the major slogan of the Green Movement was, where is my vote? And it was crushed. Now, those who participated in the movement or were major participants, I should say, were educated people from middle classes in large towns and especially Tehran. 
And if you look at what, where the green movement was happening, it is basically in large towns where there were universities, large universities, because the bulk of people who belong to the, the green movement were young people and very much very educated people not only young but educated although you could see several generations demonstrating although there were also some workers and some peasants who would come to large towns to demonstrate but the bulk of those people were from really educated middle classes and they wanted they wanted to implement change within the regime to democratize regime institutions well, it failed and it was repressed. What happened was that the, the repression of the movement radicalized demands. And even though in 2013 with Rouhani, a lot of those who had been engaged in the green movement, who still remained in Iran because a lot of them left the country, including women's rights activists, left the country. but. Those who remained and some others voted again for Rouhani in 2013 because he was con considered as a moderate one and still had hopes on a moderate president to implement reforms from within the regime. This failed. Again, radicalization. And also what happened was that when people vote, especially women vote, engage in politics as voters, for instance, but they are being, they're not being respected because Rouhani also during the electoral campaign promised a lot to women and did not do a thing once in power, really. I mean, he was, he disillusioned women uh, as voters to begin with. And it was not the first time. The most important thing was Khatami himself, because no president in the, the history of the Islamic regime was as popular as Khatami was. I was, I went to Iran, I was doing my field work. Uh, I would see people, their enthusiasm and so on. Many people voted for the first time under the Islamic regime for Khatami. He betrayed them. He betrayed them. And the same thing with Rouhani. Because at one point, when you see that the leader, Velayat Fari, is do not agree with you and is forcing you to do something which is a betrayal to your electoral promises or the promises you made to people, you have to stand up to your ideas. If you have ideas, you have to stand up and respect your voters' vote. Khatami didn't and Rouhani didn't either. And their major argument was, I wanted to, but I couldn't because the leader did not agree. So the whole thing uh, really did participate, this disillusionment and the fact that reforms cannot take place within this regime participated in the radicalization of demands of the population and those who are in the streets and who are fighting and who are major actors of what I call this ongoing revolution are the ones whose parents had voted for Khatami in the 1990s, early 20s and some others who might have even voted for Rouhani in 2013. And so this illusion people and they have come to the conclusion, this is clear, that this regime is not reformable and you have to change it. From within, you can't reform it. You have to change it and these people should go. So this is what has been happening. Another major difference with the Green Movement was that the Green Movement was basically what I call a Shiite movement. And today you have, as I mentioned, every a diversity everybody is in in the revolutionary movement every ethnicity every religion and genders including lgbt's this is very very important and as far as i know i compare it with the constitutional revolution in terms of its components in terms probably of also the definition that iranians are providing for themselves who are we again they are asking the question of who are we are we religious before being Iranian or ethnicity before being Iranian? A very large definition of who an Iranian is and probably the belonging to this territory is enough regardless of who you are. That should be decisive and important. So, so, and this is the basis of equality.
between genders, between ethnicities, religions, and so on. What I see is that, yeah, the regime is still in power, but thanks to the struggles of the uh, Iranian population for the past 120 days now, we have seen also some disagreements, important disagreements within the power structure itself. We have seen disagreements within the, the armed forces. It is amazing that the, the, the other day on uh, Sunday night, for instance, when people were chanting slogans against Khomeini, the leader, and against the regime, there were also Ardasiye in Tehran, which is a neighborhood lived by military and their family. And they were also chanting slogans against Khomeini and against the regime. And we have seen instances of military forces supporting prote the protesters. We have seen also that the head of the police was changed recently by Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader because he had not been repressive enough, and so on. And we have seen also several commanders of the Revolutionary Guards criticizing other commanders that they are not obeying to the leader's orders. So this means that something is happening within power structure of the regime. So this is to me crucial, although I'm not saying that the regime is falling down today, but it is important that demonstrations continue. This is crucial. And it has continued because contrary to what a lot of people, including French decision makers, for instance, some, several, many of them were saying, oh, this is like the Green Movement and the other movements, 2019, 2018, this is not the first time that Iranians are in the street and you will see they will be repressed and everything will, and you know, business as usual and from Honestly, right from the beginning, I said this is different. Why? Because you could see middle classes, lower middle classes, workers, popular you know, uh, neighborhoods. Everybody is and has been involved in this revolution. And it is very different from 2009 or even 19 or 18, when you had only parts and parts, parts and parts of various social groups. Now you have a lot of social groups, actually all groups, even the Bazaris are now involved. They used to be historically the major supporters of the ulama, of the religious leadership. Uh, now they are protesting. Of course, economic crisis and, and so on also is crucial in uh, dissatisfying the, these people. So to say that we, we can see that within the power structure, everybody does not agree with harsh repression and some people are fleeing Iran, some others are being excluded from their positions. This means that if the movement continues, then there is a big chance that the regime would fall apart. Now, I'm not doing politics, but I think that in order to accelerate this process, some, those who are in charge, if there are people who are in charge, should also engage with those uh, people within the army, within the Revolutionary Guards and elsewhere who are not killing people, who have not repressed people, to kind of make some alliances eventually for the future of Iran. This is the only way that you can accelerate the falling of the, this Islamic regime and without human cost. This is the only way. What I want to say is, again, unfortunately, people are being executed. It is easy for me to you know, be in Paris and say, go on and you know, continue to demonstrate and so on. But my understanding is that they are absolutely, and they are because they have come up to this conclusion that it is their own struggle that is crucial and it is through their own struggle that they can implement change and crucial change, political change. I'm quite optimistic about the future of Iran, but quite anxious about what's going on today. Really, the international community should do everything they can to at least lesser the cost or human cost of this revolution. And I think it might be fruitful to some extent. Something else is, I think, is if Putin falls, they will fall. Their fate is now intertwined with the fate of Putin. So it is important, you know, we should really be careful of what's going on in Ukraine and who is winning the war and what's going on and, and so on.